Let's take a moment in prayer before the message. Lord God, fill us with your word this morning. Instill in us the faith, the trust, the confidence in you so that we may glorify you through our love of Jesus Christ, our Savior. So work in us through your word this morning. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, to say that we live in chaotic times is an understatement, isn't it? I mean, there's economic circumstances, the pandem pandemic, a stretching, a uh, almost tearing, it seems, of the very fabric of our nation. And it's not just politics, is it? I mean, cancel culture and the silencing of opposing voices is ratcheting to ever new heights. To say now that there are simply two genders, and only two genders, now will unleash a wave of hatred against you, and you can even lose your job because of just saying that. It seems that evil itself has been unleashed evermore, and the forces of evil seem to get, be gathering in our particular culture at this time. Yet no matter the circumstances that we are in right now, evil has been unleashed many times throughout our history. And we have seen a culture of evil throughout generations. It has a, a, a way of repeating itself, you could say, in some degrees. And see, so for us, for you and me right now, in this time, in this culture, no matter how difficult the circumstances are, we are to stand firm in our faith. And we are to cling to God's word. And if you get nothing else this morning, that should be it, to stand firm in your faith and to cling to God and his word. Let me tell you about a man who lived in such an evil time as well. His name is Elijah. Elijah lived in a time when things were beyond awful. King after king had sinned against the Lord. And finally, there was a king named Ahab who married Jezebel. Now, if you want to reference 1 Kings chapter 16, starting with verse 29. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And as, it had been a, and as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel and went and served Baal and worshiped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria, and Ahab made an asher. So together, Ahab and Jezebel made an altar to worship Baal, and they were literally forcing people into worshiping Baal and Asherah. So false god and goddess worship. Asherah is the female version of Baal, and Asherah was the goddess, so to speak, that Jezebel worshiped. But it wasn't just false worship, which was awful and evil in the sight of the Lord. If you recall, not that long ago, I talked also how Ahaz burned his own son as an offering to Baal. I mean, this is as bad and as evil and a wicked culture and generation that had ever been for that time. And in the midst of this comes Elijah. Charles Swindoll describes Elijah as plunging full force in, in the midst of this era of gross evil and wickedness. And so in the midst of this gross wickedness, Elijah brings the word of the Lord. For it is God's word that brings life and restoration. It is God's word that brings life and restoration. So this morning, we're gonna take a look at three things. 
we're going to take a look at the word received, the word doubted, and then the word assured. So let's begin with first with the word received. And we are in 1 Kings chapter 17, starting in verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Well, so first of all, notice that Elijah received a word from the Lord. And what did Elijah do? He was obedient to the word of the Lord. He did as the Lord commanded. So first of all, you and I should all learn from Elijah about obedience to God's word. Now, he meets this widow, right? And any time in the Old Testament or even in the New Testament, if there's a widow, you can almost be guaranteed that she is poor. But the picture of this woman is that she is She's more than poor. She's not even dirt, dirt poor. I mean, she really has practically nothing left. I mean, she's even out of hope, right? All that she has is this little bit of f- uh, flour in a jar and a little bit of oil in a jug, and that's all she has. And along comes this stranger, Elijah, she didn't know who he was, and he has the audacity not only to ask her for some water, but Could she bring him some food as well? And her response to Elijah is interesting. She says, as the Lord your God lives. And then she goes on to say, I have nothing. As a matter of fact, I'm just doing one last meal so my son and I can die. But there's that phrase that goes by pretty fast that we need to pause for just a moment. As the Lord your God lives. She's saying that as the Lord, and Lord all caps mean Yahweh, as Yahweh your God lives. Now you have to understand, this is all against Baal worship. See, Elijah had declared a drought, and there was drought for so long, there was no water, animals were dying, brooks, streams, everything was drying up. People thought that Baal was dead. He must be dead because everything had dried up. Everything was as dust. So in the land of Baal worship, their God was dead. But this woman, even though she might not have known exactly what she was saying, she says something very different as the Lord your God lives. That's a proclamation of a different reality. It says that the Lord your God, Elijah, is not a God of the dead, but a God of the living, for he lives. You see, just as Job went through horrific times, awful times, and he was in despair, yet he could proclaim this phrase, I know that my Redeemer lives. In the midst of all the death and despair, the heartache and the sorrow, he can still make the proclamation, I know my Redeemer lives. See, you and I, in the midst of all of our circumstances, in the midst of even facing sickness and illness and death, can still proclaim an Easter message we can still proclaim he is risen. He is risen indeed. You see, that is a proclamation of a different reality because we serve a risen living Lord. And he is there 
with us. That is a proclamation that should sustain us throughout everything. He is risen. And I know you want to say it. He is risen indeed. So this woman says, as the Lord your God lives. Now, she might not have known the fullness of what she was saying. She probably didn't because she was still in despair. She's preparing for her last meal, in essence. But Elijah is now going to give her a word of the Lord that is one of life, not of death. Starting verse 13. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said. But first, make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterward, make me something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of sh flour shall not be spent and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day of the Lord sends rain upon the earth. So here again, this proclamation, do not fear. You know, uh, we've talked about do not fear. Talked about it last week, Christmas message on it. So many messages about do not fear. And believe me, when I was choosing the text this, uh, for, for the message, it, this wasn't even on my mind, but there it is, right? Do not fear. So it's a gentle calling that he says to her, do not fear. And he doesn't try to dissuade her from her situation about the last meal she's about to prepare, but he gives her a promise. He gives her a promise. And the promise starts off with this. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. He is saying here is a word of God the Lord. You see, all good, right, sure promises come from the word of the Lord, from his very lips. What he pronounces comes true. And this should bring us great comfort. You know, there's a section in Isaiah, Isaiah 55, that I just love. It says this, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than, than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that which goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. When God declares something, it is. And we are assured by that. You see, God's word is sure and true. And it is to his word that we cling in faith. Listen, during times like this, I don't want sweet little words that will somehow tickle my ears and try to make me feel better. I don't want vain philosophy of mankind. I, I, don't, I don't want any of that. I want to hear the word of the Lord. Rather than talk about COVID and the pandemic and everything else, what have, talk to me about Jesus. Tell me, I want to hear about Jesus, my Lord and Savior. I want his words because his words are everlasting. The words of the world, they, they fade quickly like a flower, like a mist that they are gone. They crumble throughout time. But the word of Jesus Christ remains forever. He said, Matthew 24 Verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. See, I want his words because it's when I have his words, I stand on a sure foundation that is not shaken. 
Jesus said this in Luke chapter 6, everyone who comes to me and hears my word and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug a who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose and the stream broke against it, that house could not shake it and could not shake it because it had been well built. I'm going to read it again. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against the house and could not shake it because it had been well built. You see, the ultimate test, the ultimate test of one's faith is that we need to believe in the word of the Lord despite all the circumstances. When we believe and build upon the word of the Lord, we will not be shaken. As a matter of fact, we can count it all joy. This is what James wrote. He says, count count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So the word of the Lord was given to the widow and her son. Now, I don't know exactly what went through her mind at that time. Did she really start to believe? Did she kind of believe? She at least trusted Elijah, who seemed to speak for the Lord. But through the word and the word received, they were sustained. So we have the word received, but now we have also the word doubted. Going on in our text. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. And his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, what have you against me, O man of God? You have come, you have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. Now, Elijah has probably been with this widow for about a year. And during all of this time, the flour, the oil has not run out. They have been sustained in the midst of this awful drought. It kind of reminds me of Moses and the Israelites going through the desert. And they were sustained by manna from heaven. And they were able to collect enough each and every day to sustain himself. Now you would think that For the Israelites, that would have been sufficient, right? That they were sustained, but yet they started to grumble. Well, we want some meat. We want some other things to eat. At least we had better food back in our our time of slavery. For this woman here, this widow, you would have think that she would have been amazed that they didn't have their last meal, that they were able to continue to eat through it all. But then a tragedy befalls And her son becomes so ill that there's no breath in him. Now, there are some commentators who say that he actually didn't die, that he just couldn't breathe well. But I think uh, I can't get that from the text. When I read the text, that there is no breath in him, that the son is killed. So we let scripture interpret scripture. The son had died. And so now, now what happens? She blames Elijah. And she said to Elijah, what have you against me, O man of God? You have come to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. You see, in our time of pain, our time of grief, we really want to look for someone to blame. See, rather than seeing Elijah as a man who is bringing good things into the house, now she considers him to have brought evil into the house. To bring sin to remembrance is to say that Elijah brought her sin to the Lord so that the Lord would put judgment upon her son. That she was being punished. 
Unfortunately, when tragedy strikes, people often end up blaming God. Many people end up rejecting faith in God because bad things happen. You see, their faith is not built on the solid rock. Their faith is built on circumstances. And a lot of people will flock to religion or to faith because it'll help them get a job, it'll help them get married, it'll help them feel good, it'll help them overcome addictions. All of those are really good things, by the way. But when the circumstances come, when the flood comes in, they are then washed away because they aren't built on the rock. You see, I have heard so many stories and have also been the recipient of people blaming the pastor or the priest or somebody because bad things happened. And my heart actually goes out to them because I know that they don't know Jesus. But you and I, you and I are to build our faith on the rock and on his word, and thus we are sustained in the good and in the bad times. We are to trust him through it all. And all the while, and this is important, all the while understanding that we live in a fallen world. And in a fallen world, bad things happen. See, if you lack that as part of your understanding of the world in which we live, you will never be able to have that full faith in Christ Jesus. In a fallen world, bad things happen. I uh, have a friend from a long time ago whose daughter uh, was grown, got married, and she became pregnant. And there was a lot of rejoicing, a lot of rejoicing. But they also had some tests done and the test revealed that their child would be born, and it was a daughter, the daughter would be born with genetic defects so severe that they knew she wouldn't have much of a chance to survive. Now, I don't recall the instances, but I, I'm sure people, I'm sure the doctors, I'm sure family and friends said that she should abort the child, but she refused. She refused because she knows, she knows that life is a precious gift from God who is the author of life. And so she carried the pregnancy through and the daughter was born. And not many days afterwards, they had to say goodbye to their daughter. You know, it was just heartbreaking to read. But this woman said this, she wrote this. We prayed for clear direction. And once she was born, and this diagnosis gave us exactly that. God knows what we need, but sometimes blessings just look a little different than what we expect. Although his plans make no sense to us right now, God is still good. Even in this, God is good. See, she knew who God is. She knows who Jesus is as Lord and Savior. And that even if we don't comprehend everything that is happening right now, God is still good throughout it all. And so she was not shaken. Now, isn't that the type of faith that you and I are to have in Christ Jesus? That even when illness, when death, when dire circumstances, when the evil of the world seem to be overwhelming, we look to our Savior, the author, the perfecter of life, the Alpha and the Omega. And we look to Him knowing that he is good all the time. 
We even remember the promises that he's given us. Last week, I mentioned Romans chapter 8, 38. Let's go back to that again. It says, for I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So there is the word received. Then the word is doubted. The son had died. But now there's the word assured. So let's go to this. So first of all, Elijah. You have to remember Elijah, even though he was considered second only to Moses as a prophet, he was still a man just like us, you and I in our nature. That's what it says in James chapter 5, verse 17. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. So he felt pain and he felt sorrow and anguish. And so he cries out in a very human way. He's, and he cried to the Lord, O Lord, my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son? But here's the difference. Here's the difference. Elijah didn't simply turn away from God and turn away from faith. What does he do? He actually takes that son and he brings him up into this upper room and he lays him down and he prostrates himself over him. And it says in verse 21, three times he cried to the Lord, O Lord, my God, let this child's life come into him again. What did Elijah do? Elijah wrestled with God. He wrestled with God in prayer. And this is what you and I should do, wrestle with God in prayer. He appealed to the word of the Lord. He reminded God of his promise. And in faith, he asked to, for the boy's life to be restored. You see, you have to understand during this time in, in Israel, resurrection of the dead was not a thing considered at all. The dead didn't come back to life. By the way, that's in part why Elijah was such a great prophet, because the dead came to life. Through his prayer to God, God brought the son from death to life. One writer said it like this, the praying prophet seized the word of promise with both hands and would not let go. That was the ground on which he could and had to base his plea, clinging to the Lord's oath. He could rest assured that the Lord would hear his prayer. And man, he was a man of prayer at that time. And he prayed without doubt. He clung to the word, to the promise, and he prayed without doubt. And that's how you and I are to pray, without doubt. James chapter 1, verse 6 says, But let him ask in faith without doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Look, this is a time in our life, in our culture, in this world, where prayer is needed and fervent prayer is needed of holding on, of grasping the word of the Lord. Now, I am not going to stand here and say that because you pray, there won't be any trouble or tribulation, that life will simply be a bed of roses. But we're not promised that, are we? We actually are promised that there will be tribulation, there will be trials, there will be sorrow. But, but, and this is important, in the midst of all of this, there's still a promise of joy, a promise of peace, a promise of victory. And where will we find that? In his word. 
gospel reading from today. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. And then verse 33, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Your sorrow will turn to joy. Take heart, I have overcome the world. Look, these are the promises of Christ Jesus given to his disciples and thus given to us. And all of this is given to us and made sure for us in victory through the cross. You see, at the cross, right? At the cross, the message was proclaimed to the world that the love of God, the righteousness of God, the holiness of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God had conquered all of the sin of the world. See, when you understand the cross, when you understand the cross and the love and the power and the majesty the grace of God, the love of God given to us in Christ Jesus. Then you have a peace that transcends understanding. You have a sorrow that is still filled now with joy instead. And you have the assurance of eternal victory. See, Jesus rose from the grave, right? Now, just like the son, the, the widow's son rose from the dead, Jesus rose, but Jesus didn't need a prophet who was praying over, for, over him. No, he laid his life down and then he took it up again, raised by the very spirit of God. And in that he proclaimed that death was no more that there is life and life everlasting in him. And because of his word, we have the assurance that everything does turn out. This is why Paul could write. He said this, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is in the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, abounding, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. See, the widow now, seeing that her son was now alive, had assurance that the word of God is true. And so there was a faith that was there. And she said, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of God, the word of the Lord is in your mouth. I got to do that over. Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Her living son now was proof of the word of the Lord, that the Lord who lives keeps his promises. So as her son was raised from the dead, her faith was now raised up. And for you and I, as Christ is crucified and raised and lives evermore, let your faith, be raised and live. Have a living faith in our living Lord. You see, no matter the circumstances, no matter how, how bad it is, how difficult the times, we are to stand firm in our faith and in his word to trust his promises. So just as Jesus said to hear the word and then to do the word, is to build your house on the rock, on the foundation. 
we too must hear the word and apply the word so that we grow in Christ Jesus. So the first thing for you this week is this. What promises of God's word do you cling to? During all these times, what are the promises of God in his word that you cling to? I would encourage you, by the way, to go through the Gospel of John and to look for the I am statements and to cling to those promises. The second is pray like Elijah. Pray with fervency, without doubt, grabbing hold of God's words and his promises. And the third thing for you to do is live and pray in the victory of the cross. Because we do have an Easter proclamation. He is risen, he is risen indeed. And to that, we say amen and hallelujah.